Hello, everybody. I'm Toby Delbrook from the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich, and I'm going to tell you about Out of This World, the memories of Gamow uh, from Max Delbrook, my father. Here you can see Gamow at an auditorium explaining uh, some concept of cosmology in 1952, so about um, maybe seven years after the war ended and when Gamow was already safely inside the U.S., having escaped the Soviet Union. Um, and this, my history with Gamow, I never actually met him, but uh, it was a good friend of my father's, as I'm going to explain. And here's a photo from 1973. You can see me here, 13 years old, with Max's Phycomyces group in Cold Spring Harbor, about five years after Joe, Joe Gamow died. And at that time, Igor Gamow, Max's, was uh, uh, George's son, was doing a postdoc with Max at Caltech. And um, we maintain contact with Igor and his wife, Alfreda. Here is a picture from 40 years later in Pasadena with Igor and Alfreda and my sister, Nikki, and my father's very last student, Dave Presti, who is lecturer at UC Berkeley. So a lot of these stories, actually, I heard from my parents, but uh, they also come from the fantastic book, The Eighth Day of Creation, from Horace Judson, who I had a chance to meet at the Max Delbrook Centennial in, in Salamanca in around 2012. And also from this lovely book from Gino Segre, Ordinary Geniuses, the story of, of uh, Joe Gamow and Max Delbrook. You can see how often they're mentioned here in the Eighth Day of Creation, which is an absolutely amazing masterwork from Horace Judson. Uh, Gamow is mentioned 192 times. And in Gino Segre's book, Gamow, or Joe, actually, as he's called in the book, is mentioned 655 times. So if you want to read any more about the history of molecular biology or about uh, the contribution of Max and Joe to molecular biology and, and physics, you can read about them in Gino's book. But um, I, this is something from uh, the eighth day of creation. So uh, actually, this is from Gino Segre's book. So uh, shortly after, I'm sure many of you are well aware that shortly after Watson and he, uh, Watson and Crick published the double helix paper in Nature, uh, George Gamow came up with a scheme uh, which explained how DNA coded for amino acids and how amino acids were joined into proteins. And the scheme went like this. Uh, the uh, amino acids were supposed to fit into the spaces inside the double helix. Uh, and George Gamow was a numerology, came up with a miraculous solution that this code exactly fit the 20 of amino acids found in nature. Might he, George Gamow, a rank outsider, have cracked the great poly a great problem in biology? And now this is from the, the eighth day of creation. Um, this is Max talking to Horace Judson about Joe's coding model of DNA after the double helix paper from Watson and Crick, the denouncement. But look out, Delbrook said, the denouncement of the double helix this time at this point was only with respect to the structure and the replication mechanism. How you used the Watson and Crick structure to, as we now say, code for anything to carry genetic specificity, that was still very, very obscure. Was it not even evident that the place to look for this for what look for the place to look was in the sequence of nucleotides in some way of course for that was the only degree of freedom left but how could you use this sequence to code information for amino acids to build proteins which is completely baffling it was george gamow a physicist not a chemist who had the boldness the boldness a few months later to propose an extremely simple scheme that the amino acids themselves fitted physically into the dna into the slot between the two chains Every chemist immediately saw this was utter nonsense. It was manifest, it was complete crap from the stereochemical point of view. And yet, as it turned out, he was remarkably co close to the truth. So in retrospect, the denouncement was that, that both the principle of replication and the principle of coding was simple, and the actual machinery of doing it is immensely complex. So that was Joe's main contribution to molecular biology, to get the biologists to think about coding. But now I want to turn to some other stories uh, from this chapter that Max wrote 
uh, called Out of This World in the George, what turned out to be the George Gamow Memorial Volume, Cosmology, Fusion, and Other Matters, edited by Frederick Reins. And these are some memories of Max from uh, rooming together with Joe in Göttingen and later on. So this is Fleeting Apparition, Göttingen, 1928. In the Café Kronenlands in the heart of town, you could sit by the window on the second floor and watch life go by. Somebody pointed out to me a slightly sensational figure, a Russian student of theoretical physics, fresh from Leningrad. That was something new. Few Russian scientists have been seen in Germany since the revolution, certainly no students. This one had even written an interesting paper on alpha decay or was in the process of doing it. And quite a figure he was too, very tall and thin, looking even taller for his erect carriage, blonde, a huge skull, and a grating high-pitched voice. Das Fogelschen im vierten Stock, the little bird in the fourth floor, Pauli said, talking in German or any language of his own without the slightest he hesitation, articulate, playful, irreverent, and thoroughly unconventional. The next memory is from Stark Reality in Copenhagen in 1931 at Bohr's Institute. Gamow and I, that's Max, roomed together in the Pension Hav, triangle to two minutes from the Institute, Bohr's Institute. I, that's Max, had come from Bristol to Copenhagen, the proud possessor of a black bowler hat in emulation of Dirac, the counterpart of a beer today and as provocative. Within a few days, Gamow had poured liquid air into this hat. On dropping it, a piece the shape of Africa broke out of the crown. This was sent as a postcard to a friend in Göttingen. 1931, a challenge taken up. The year 1931 opened with a stunning stunt. The January 9th issue of Naturwissenschaften contained a Kurze Original Mitteilung, that's a short note, entitled, Concerning the Quantum Theory of the Absolute Zero of Temperature, the note was signed by G. Beck, H. Beta, W. Rietzler, three German postdocs at the Cavendish Laboratory. It read, and by the way, this is Hans Beta, I'm sure, the famous nuclear physicist who was involved in the Manhattan Project and was called the uh, battleship in opposition to Feynman, Dick Feynman, who was the mosquito. Anyway, this note read, let us consider a hexagonal crystal lattice. The absolute zero of this lattice is characterized by the fact that all degrees of freedom of the system are frozen out, all, i.e. all inner movements of the lattice have ceased, with the exception, of course, of the motion of an electron in its Bohr orbit. According to Eddington, every electron has one over alpha, this is uh, the fine structure constant, degrees of freedom, where one over, where alpha is the fine structure constant of Sommerfeld. Besides electrons, our crystal contains only protons, and for these, the number of degrees of freedom is obviously the same, since according to Dirac, a proton is considered to be a hole in a glass of electrons. Therefore, to get to the absolute zero, we have to remove from the substance per neutron equals one electron plus one proton. A crystal has to carry no net charge. Two over alpha minus one degrees of freedom, since one degree of freedom has to remain for the orbital motion. We thus obtain for the zero point temperature T zero equals minus, 2 over alpha minus 1 degrees. Putting T0 equals minus 273 degrees, absolute zero, we obtain for 1 over alpha the value of 137 in perfect agreement within the limits of accuracy with the value obtained by totally independent methods. It can be seen very easily that our result is independent of the particular crystal lattice chosen. Max writes, the way we read papers, that is now, with absolute trust in the good intentions of authors and publishers, one has to look twice or three times to switch from puzzlement through outrage to a realization of being confronted with the rarest thing in science, a joke. And what a joke. The editor of the Dürer Fischenschaft and the charming and highly intelligent Mr. Berliner had fallen for it. Even the great Sommerfeld in Munich had asked Dr. Rietzler in all earnestness at the end of a seminar to explain his recent note to the audience. Gamow could not sleep for a week. Somebody had outdone him. 
Berliner was furious. He demanded an apology from the authors. On March 6th, there, there appeared a correction in the Naturwissenschaften. The note by G. Beck, Beta, and Rietzler, published in the January 9th issue of the journal, was not meant to be taken seriously. It was intended to characterize a certain class of papers in theoretical physics of recent years, which are purely speculative and based on spurious numerical agreements. In a letter received by the editors from the gentlemen, they blah, blah, blah. Okay. The next day, Gamow had his plan. Wait for another outrageous paper, convince Berliner that he had again been victimized by a prankster, and pressure him to publish another retraction. We did not have long to wait. On April 4th, there appeared a note by A.V. Das, Origin of Cosmic Penetrating Radiation, another, rather similar in style, as a matter of fact, to the one by the Cambridge Trio, and perhaps just as absurd. Now, the plan went into effect. Gamow wrote to Berliner from Copenhagen. Rosenfeld sent his letter via his home base in Liege, and Pauli was to write from Zurich, all three to the same effect. The morals of the young generation are deplorable. Outrage about the Beck, Beta, Rietzler scandal. Satisfaction at seeing Berliner's correction. Dismay at seeing him victimized again. Gamow got a curt reply suggesting he was mistaken about the author's intent. A few days later, Rosenfeld got this reply forwarded from Liege. Dear Mr. Rosenfeld, the paper by Das has already brought me a similar spark, sharp protest from Gamow. I have now discussed the matter with Professor Cole Horster. The latter is of a slightly different opinion. Of course, the paper presents an enormously far-fetched idea, extremely unlikely to be true and quite unverifiable. However, I believe that one cannot compare a wild speculation presented as no more than, say, numerology with the thing of Beta, Beck, and Rietzler, which you rightly describe as a schoolboy's prank. For me, the editor, these short notes are some, at times a real curse, but I'm afraid I cannot discontinue them. At this point, Bohr learned about the plot emanating from his institute. These Russians, Landau had just left, are so refreshing. He was torn between amusement and fear of offending his old friend Berliner. What should he do about it? Send Gamow to Berliner to explain? But what had Pauli done from Zurich? Had he too written as agreed over the last bottle of wine in Copenhagen? After a long wait, word came that he had weakened. In a more sober mood, he had not been able to, to bring himself to do the old man Berliner in. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, the rest of this lovely out of this world uh, describes um, uh, a paper which attempted to be published in, a, in a, uh, one of the journals of the time on the determination of the velocity of an object moving in the fluid on the basis of a single photograph. And it stemmed from Gamma's fascination with this photograph of Pauli in the Lake Maggiore in Switzerland. And um, it describes how to calculate the, the speed of Pauli's motion through the water based on the wake here that he cast. Um, but alas, this paper was never actually published, and you can find it in this chapter in whole, translated to English. So, enough. A brief sum, spring and summer out of a lifetime. Enough for ordinary mortals. We might be carried along for a while, but could not keep it up. These Russians didn't just talk jokes, they lived them. They were certainly out of this world. And now let me just conclude with one uh, original thought. <laughs> It's my only contribution to this whole business. Where does this name from this chapter out come out of this world, right? This is the, why Max attributes to the Russian. Well, it's well known um, that anyone spending an evening with George Gamow was assured of a good time. He himself loved a good time and he went out of his way to ensure that he had one. He made up funny poems. He drew delightful whimsical drawings. He organized charades and skits. He waylaid people, good looking young women in particular to demonstrate his latest magic tricks. And it turns out that Max, my father, knew exactly one magic trick. And it was a magic trick that Gamow had taught him. It's a beautiful trick. And do you know what the name of that trick is? It's called Out of This World. It's a fantastic trick invented by magician Paul Curry in 1942. And so I believe that somehow Gamow learned this card trick sometime after 1942, the around, this is actually invented during World War II, and he taught it to Max, and then Max knew this name out of this world, and he associated with Gamow, and that's why he named his chapter Out of This World. 
And so with that, I'll leave you to um, enjoy the, the real science of the Gamov conference, and I'm happy to be part of it. I leave you here with this slide, and I'm going to put links to this chapter, Out of This World. Also, um, a lovely article from Peter Fisher, who was uh, one of my father's postdocs and became a well-known uh, writer of popular science books, um, who took part in, in the Odessa conference in 2019, Molecular Biology, a creation of physicists with the help of George Kamoff. I'll put a link to that. I'll also put a link to these slides. And here are the three main sources for this presentation. Thank you.